When hiring nurses, doctors, or any other clinical role, pay is often ranked in the top three most important aspects when accepting the job. So how can HR or recruiters increase their salaries to become the obvious choice to job seekers? Today, SHRM's director, Amber Clayton, and a board member from the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, Desiree Hodges, will be covering how to redirect labor cost savings to increase compensation for those potential hires. Let's get into it. First and foremost, I want to point to this very first slide uh, we have from um, an article on business leadership today, and it's how much does compensation matter when recruiting healthcare staff? So looking at a couple of these quotes for those who might just be listening in, this first quote on the left, 80% of healthcare candidates cite pay as the most important factor in their job search. 81% said pay and benefits is the biggest influencing factor for whether they would accept a job offer. And then this last quote saying three out of five healthcare talent leaders expect retirement savings planning and financial benefits to increase in importance to recruit skilled employees as reported by SHRM. So I want to hear, um, Amber, you know, from you, where do you think just taking into the slide in consideration, where do you think pay ranks in terms of importance for prospective hires? I think, in well, in general, I have data on that. It's nine out of 10 U.S. workers or 87% believe that fair compensation for current employees should be the top priority. So Mm -hmm. um, it definitely ranks in the top three and it it has for the last several years. So um, I think it's, uh, you know, really important for people. But then at the same time, and I think this goes back to one of the, the things that you mentioned is that it can't solely be about the compensation and and the benefits offering. Um, It's the whole package. And so, uh, you know, looking at workplace culture, your brand, how are you treating people with empathy? You know, uh, do you have, um, what's been really important to many candidates is mental health and well-being. And, uh, you know, that's, I think, sometimes a mistake that we focus so much on hiring people at higher rates, but then once they get in there and they realize this really isn't a great place to work, the money's not worth it. I'm going to go somewhere else. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Desiree, what are your thoughts? The same thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I do think for sure uh, it is all about the culture and the environment and spending time up front with the candidate to let them know what that is when they're coming into it. And I think the more, times that they hear it because they have so many different touch points until they actually get to the actual first day of the job and having that culture discussed all of the things that we do to support um you know you know your emotional well-being and all of those things talking about the environment talking about the values the core values of the organization i think all of every touch point that they have you have to you know, really drive that home because you're right. Yes. Up front, you're going to get a salary, but, Mm -hmm. and I think we probably all have workplaces where the money just didn't, it it doesn't matter because if I'm not treated um, fair, or if I feel like my work environment is not a positive one that affects your mental health. Yeah. I mean, no doubt. And so I think that we have to really look at some of those things and really have our partners and organizations put out there what that looks like. Why should culture matter to you? Why should your benefits matter to you? All of those things. And I think that if we focus some of the attention on that, then yes, I'm going to get paid a fair salary. It's not like you're going to go make $20 more at a hospital across the street than this one, because it's all fair and equitable, like in the market. Um, And I think People are, for the most part, honestly competitive with their pay. It's really about what type of work culture you're looking for. Absolutely. You know, as a nurse, Desiree, and somebody who's a part of the AACN, what are some areas that you think uh, where labor cost savings can actually be identified or spared, so to speak, without compromising patient care or staff satisfaction? Um. That is a hard question to ask a nurse because <laughs> it's definitely not the nurse. I don't think um, I, that's just that's a hard question. But when I, I sit back and think about it, I think it's some of some of the work that I'm doing currently. Mm. Um, so really providing the support to the nurse leader who's leading the unit and maybe that helps um, offset some of the. I don't know if it's 
I think it still has a financial impact because if I'm more productive in retention, yeah. like if I'm more if I'm retaining more, it in turn reduces that labor cost. Right? Yeah. It costs, we know, thousands of dollars to onboard someone. Um, so we can continue to hire people all day long. But if we do not fix the culture and the environment where they work, they're going to leave. And guess what? We're going to be doing it all over again. So I, I don't really look at it as can I cut this job or cut that job. I look at it two different ways. I look at it if I'm fully staffed, if I have appropriate staffing, then I can deliver quality care. My outcomes will be fine and we'll get reimbursed as we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. The other place we look at savings is that retention. If I retain the staff that I have, I'm not continuously spending thousands and thousands of dollars to recruit and also retrain people um, to come in and out of the department. So I really don't look at it as cutting labor. I look at it as being strategic with the labor and looking at the environment that you have. I that that's a great point. And the turnover costs themselves really is huge in terms of labor costs. So of course, mitigating that again, mm-hmm. making sure your culture is in check, making sure your staff is relatively engaged and I mm-hmm. not on the verge of burnout, which I think is something really important to highlight within the healthcare industry when we're kind of talking about clinical roles. I think that's so important. Uh, Amber, what are your thoughts on, you know, labor cost savings without sacrificing patient or staff satisfaction? Yeah, that's a good question. I think just making sure that there's appropriate staffing levels. I think that, you know, looking at those patient to staff ratios, I know that there's, you know, certain requirements, but at the same time, you don't want a nurse who's handling too many patients and then it's sacrificing the quality of work. Um, Something, for example, where documentation and um, let's say they don't have time and they end up coding things incorrectly and then the insurance isn't, you know, um, paying what they should be paying. So Mm -hmm. there's there's uh, a savings there if you have, you know, accurate uh, information in your documentation and all of these things kind of affect one another. So um, I think as far as um, maybe labor cost savings, I would say, you know, looking to your internal staff and your succession planning, and do you have people who you might be able to upskill to be able to take on some of those CNA and and CMA positions? I know there was a, I don't remember the name of the company or the person, but um, our CHRO CHRO had spent some time with someone who worked in the hospital and they were actually upskilling people who were in like janitorial positions to become CNAs. And, um, you know, I think, you know, trying to do things in-house can be really helpful. Yep, absolutely. I think the aspect of upskilling is really important. We actually have um, this medical center called My Health and they have 80 so locations, uh, over 800 staff, right? So they have a lot to manage, a lot on the bird's eye perspective for their CHRO. Uh, Natasha, who's our systems development manager, we have a whole article on our site that you guys can look into about this, but they're having issues with labor costs, right? Maintaining 80 practices is a very hefty load. And obviously talking about the 800 plus staff, the thought of increasing wages to actually remain competitive was beyond possibilities, right? It wasn't even in the cards for them. So they actually ended up signing up with us and using the timesheet and payroll automation all in one system. They were able to cut down on the admin side of things, the admin costs. And, you know, instead of spending hours and hours a week, they were able to save a ton of hours and actually use people who were on the admin side of things and upskill them to more manager positions, recruitment positions, that sort of things, thinking of, you know, uh, spending more time there and using their time and money more efficiently, putting that towards wages, whatever it was. So they were actually able to save uh, over 200 a week, even just on the admin side of things, because it was automated with things like workforce, um, you know, their HCM system. So things like that, again, getting technological with it, very, very helpful, right? And I think it really adds up at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter. Desiree, how do you recommend HR benchmark pay amongst competitors or companies in their sub-industries? So thinking, you know, vet, dentist, uh, you know, even large-scale hospitals, whatever their niche might be. Uh, I think when I think about that, it's, it's really... It's hard to compare because it's not apples to apples, but there are different ways. I think that healthcare as a whole, they really do a good job with that benchmarking 
piece. I think where we really, it's really looking at the value that the person is bringing. Um, and even though this is our benchmark for healthcare workers, right? CNA should get paid this amount, RN should get paid this amount. Really looking at, I think we look at benchmarking, but we also, is someone doing evaluation of those people that are taking care of patients and, right. um, you know, that are out in the community? Because it's not just what we do inside the hospital. We also have to serve the families and the communities yes. around us. And so I think there's a lot more value to bring, um, to look at. I think we look at it, we should look at things a little differently. Nursing, I can, I mean, I've been a nurse for almost 30 years. <laughs> so I can tell you the skills that I had 30 years ago and what I was doing then is totally different. Um, and what was required of me to be a new grad nurse at that time is totally different for what is required now mm -hmm. in the specialties that nurses have. And not even just nurses, like CNAs. Thing, I was a CNA the whole time I was in college. And what I was doing then, like now there's these additional skills that CNAs have, like you said, upscaling. You know, now they do EKGs and blood draws in some of the facilities. Right. And so I think it's really, yes, we do benchmark across the healthcare um, arena, but is there a valuation that goes along? Yeah. With it? Um, and so I think that at this point, I would really love to see that. Absolutely. And I, I you have a great point in not getting caught up in the weeds with benchmarking mm -hmm. with metrics. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, we're dealing with people and we're dealing with families, we're dealing with patients. It's mm -hmm. important to make sure that that qualitative data isn't getting trumped or that quantitative data isn't trumping the qualitative data. So yeah. Amber, I'm curious what your thoughts are, you know, more from that HR standpoint in benchmarking. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think, and this doesn't just go with the healthcare, but any mm -hmm. organization should be looking at their salaries and comparing them to the market and, you know, determining whether or not they can, you know, they can either exceed or meet, or they might have to lag the market. And what are they going to do if, they're not reaching that market rate. I think one of the things that employers tend to do is give the standard benefit package to everybody and give you know one salary to everybody, whereas they should really be customizing it. Um, you know, looking at your population of employees and determining what are their needs. If I'm a college student and I come to work for your organization, it, for me, it might not matter that I get early retirement. I might want student loan debt <laughs> repayment. Right. Um, you know, just like if I'm someone who's retired coming back into work, dependent care is not going to be something that I'm going to need. So, you know, really looking at your employee populations and making customizations, you know, for your employee population is important. Um, and also, too, with the compensation, there's a lot of organizations that can increase their compensation. So there might be other things they can do, like um, a bonus, or they can do do, um, uh, you know, merit increases at a certain amount, or uh, I know some people have like a sign-on bonus, things like that. So there could be some other things that are monetary that could be done mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily, you know, just increasing the wages. I will say on the, on the compensation side, though, um, there are many employers that are voluntarily posting their ranges on their job postings. Um, some states actually do require it now. And what they're finding is that they're getting more people applying for the jobs because they're putting it out there. This is how much we pay. And then you're having people say, OK, I can do that. And I'm going to come in and apply for this job as opposed to another organization that might not put their their ranges. I think that's a great point, uh, kind of feeding into this next question, but this is a really good point to present to leadership if HR is having any issues with roadblocks within leadership teams saying, hey, we're not sure about reallocating these labor cost savings to compensation or to benefits or to a bonus. So Amber, what do you think other roadblocks might be that HR might come across when presenting to leadership saying, hey, what if we reallocated these labor cost savings to compensation and how can they overcome these said roadblocks? Yeah, I think oftentimes there are roadblocks in the not being able to see the long term um, gain from mm -hmm. actually, you know, maybe increasing the benefits or enhancing them or the compensation. So I think, you know, it takes an HR professional to really look at the data and say, hey, look, if we did this, the return on investment will be that sure. and really them and, you know, financially how it could impact the organization, but also be able to help the patients 
in the employees. And so I think it's just a matter of coming up with that business case to present to them instead of just saying, hey, can we implement this technology and it costs twenty thousand mm. dollars, you know, with what's, what's the return? So you gotta just yes. think, you know, what's the return, how long is it gonna take? Um, I think just sharing that monetary value and the value to the patients and the employees is gonna be key. Thank you so much for watching that segment from our webinar on how to improve recruitment of clinical roles in healthcare. If you'd like to watch the full webinar, click this video here and be sure to subscribe for more content like this.